Welcome to We're People First, The Jeff Moyer Show. Here's Christy Moyer. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm sharing the screen with my favorite person here, <laughs> Jeff. But well, before I turn the mic over to you, honey, I am going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, maybe some housekeeping things, and then we're going to get into the show. First Good. of all, I've done an audio description of the studio in previous shows, so I'll just be real brief here. We are in Je Jeff's recording studio in San Diego, California, and to uh, his one side you see a roll-top desk, and I'm sitting in a place where you can't see the piano, but it is behind me. His guitar is also behind me. He'll be using that later. You see a didgeridoo sticking up in the back, and then he's got recording equipment on the back wall. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now I'm going to describe how we look. And uh, we both have silver hair, and uh, everybody uh, goes, are you siblings? Because <laughs> they're kind of the same color, you know? <laughs> so we go, always get a kick out of that. And um, Jeff wanted to wear his uh, Western look today. He's got a, a beautiful bolo tie and a silk shirt on. And my daughter sent me these beautiful earrings uh, that are Native American beading. And so that influenced my outfit, which is kind of a Native American uh, trimmed vest. Uh, and then you can't see my skirt, but it's also got that same kind of Native American pattern. So that's how we look physically. Now today's show is honoring mothers. And just a little short history here. Yeah, well, how, are you, are you gonna talk about Mother's Day, I hope? As you, as you research? Mother's Day. I am going to talk about the research I did. I love doing research for this show. It's, it's so much fun. And I'm always finding out something new, you know. So, first of all, I didn't know the beginning. And it, did, it was founded in the year of 1908 by uh, Anna Jarvis was the founder's name. And she did it in honor of her mother, who had 12 children. However, only four of them survived. Mm. And um, so that was kind of a sad thing. And until 2010, an, uh, another woman, Carly Marie Dudley, created the Bereaved Mothers Mother mm. Day. And you can see the first mother uh, that was, it was formed for was a bereaved mother. She lost all those children. Uh, but Carly lost a son to stillbirth. And her goal for the bereaved Mother's Day, it's the Sunday before Mother's Day, so it was already last week. But she's hoping that it can be included in the Mother's Day celebration. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want anyone left out. And uh, we, where people first, really go along with that because we're all about inclusion. So we're going to start off from my point of view, the first mother we need to honor is the universal mother. All cultures have a name for the feminine. It depends on the culture. Sometimes it's called Mother Earth. The Native Americans talk about Mother Earth. Isis, Kuan uh, Yin, sorry, Kuan Yin and Venus, all of those were types of a feminine energy that was honored by their culture. The universal feminine, the divine feminine. Yes. And you know, all people, even men, have a feminine side. And so we are honoring all of that today, everybody that would be in a nurturing role. So moms, of course, dads, a lot of times dads do a lot of nurturing. I know Jeff has done that. He's always called himself a diaper dad. <laughs> uh, grandparents, when I was teaching, um, I'm retired now, but when I was teaching many of my students, were being raised by their grandparents. Yes. Because one of the parents was just absent and the other parent was in prison. And so they were being raised by grandparents. Teachers, teachers have a huge nurturing role. You, you are with your students for most of the hours of the waking day. So you are certainly in that. And then we have siblings. 
that can be very nurturing. And in fact, we're going to highlight one of those siblings in our show later on. I'll let Jeff talk about that. So we're going to get on with the first part of the show, which is People First Consciousness. People First Consciousness. And, and thank you, Christy, for that. Honey. Wait. People First Consciousness. Okay. Well, People First Consciousness. You know, we've been developing this idea through the various shows, and we want to thank each of you for watching. We know that many of you tune in after the fact. We've been having thousands of people watch this show after it's been aired live. So for all of you who are in the live studio audience and, or studio live home audience, and for all of you who are watching after the fact, thank you for committing your time to this. We appreciate it. Today I want to talk about people's for, people first consciousness from the standpoint of our roles in society and in the family. There's a wonderful construct that I recently read about called social life. And of course, the opposite of that is social death. Social life is when we are protected by the web of the family, the nurturing elements of everyone in the family and the community. Then we're engaged with our social life truly. Social death is when that is removed by imprisonment, institutionalization, or any other state that takes the person out of that nurturing web of family. Excuse me, I need to grab some water here. So in the case of institutionalization, it really also addresses what's called civic death, when we're removed from society. My brother was institutionalized because of a cognitive disability when he was a little boy, only nine years old. When he was 16, he tried to run away from that hell hole of a place, and he was caught by police, beaten up so badly he couldn't be recognized, had an attack dog turned on him, then was beaten up by the attendants and the institution. I went to see him when we learned what had happened, and he was in solitary confinement. He was in a room six by 12, just as any prisoner who describes solitary confinement would tell you. My brother at that point was in social death. Through the long process of change, through the long process of advocacy, Beginning with 504, the movement to incorporate people who had been institutionalized, removed from society, gathered steam and speed. And by 1981, four years after 504, my brother was moved to a smaller institution. I came back to Ohio in 82, and I began then and there to move him into the community. And it took me uh, 13 years. By 1994, I had accomplished my end goal. Long years of advocacy. At that point, he was in, knitted back into the community. Imagine what it would be like if you or someone you loved had been removed for that long from the easy access to family and the normalcy of living. In a, in a communal situation. I don't mean in, in, in community. So my brother at first was by himself. Then another roommate was added to the supported living home that I created. And finally, the county got involved and a home was purchased and he was moved into that home with his, his friend and housemate and a third guy was added. Well, that third guy had no support from his family. So I would, and Christy would provide showering love to my brother, and the third guy was getting none of that. We would bring him a hamburger when we came back from McDonald's. On Mark's birthday, my brother's birthday, we would shower him with gifts, the same way at Christmas. But because he was jealous, as it's a human, it's a human emotion, that when someone has something we think we deserve and we don't have, we're jealous of them. So, 
even in that situation, because he was not being socially supported, he became a very destructive force in the house. So if any of you have are thinking in any way, and I've gotten a couple emails saying, how can I get involved? What could I do? One thing you could do would be to say, I want to volunteer one evening a week to contribute to someone's well-being. And if you reach out to agencies, organizations, or even families who have individuals who are, have cognitive disabilities, you can readily find people who need assistance. And then you can give them social life. Because without the, the, the knitting in to people who care for you, and caregivers are, are people who do care for the people with whom they work, but the roles change, they leave, and that then creates another little death in the lives of the people for whom they are, they're providing care. So find someone that you can provide ongoing loving support for and you will see that your life will change and certainly their life will do because all of us need that social life to feel that we're important to someone outside of ourselves that we matter that someone else is willing to extend themselves toward us that's really what being in a life that is socially alive is about it's feeling it's knowing by virtue of practice and action that we are cared for by another human being. And the greatest gift we can ever give anyone else is time. So express love and patience and kindness. Find someone who needs your love. And that is today's thought about People First Consciousness. Mothers. Mother, mm, what a sweet word. When most of us think about Mother's Day, we think about the woman who birthed us. And if we are lucky, that person was kind and loving and gave us social life. For some of us, the role of mother it was carried on by someone who might have been unfortunate or unwilling or didn't have the life experience to give lovingly. But I'd like to talk to you about, oh, you're not here. I'm, I'm over here. I will come over there in a minute. You will come over here in a minute. Good. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we're going to, to uh, provide an, a number of examples of mothers here. Are we doing Eunice next? Um, when you get finished giving the overview, yes, we're yeah. doing Eunice. So the one thing I want to say about mothering and nurturing is, Carl Jung, the great psychologist who took uh, your, um, Freud's work and really brought it into the spiritual realm, says that each of us have both a male and a female nature, and we are individualized when we're fully developed in both our male and female nature. So men out there, you too, even if you haven't been in touch with it, have that inner feminine. And it's what I what is called heart intelligence, when we're in touch with our ability to give selflessly, to nurture, to love, to care for someone else beyond ourselves. Even if you don't have children, that men, that is an element of your living that will give your life richness and fullness. I'm here now. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> in 2005, I did a 2004, I guess, I did an a audio documentary called Lest We Forget, and I interviewed parents who had, had children who were institutionalized, those who had been institutionalized, and their siblings and caregivers. I thought we would begin this segment of looking at the, at the role of mother as advocate by playing this, this segment by Eunice Powell, an incredible advocate. Listen to her story about civil disobedience. And how long is her story? Only two minutes. Okay, so for two minutes, Dr. please Fulker, listen. Who was superintendent of the institution. And uh, I said, well, I know Dr. 
pastures here because he's gold Cadillac sitting over there at his house, and he never goes any place without that gold Cadillac off of the grounds. So uh, they said, well, he's gone. And I said, well, he's here. So, and I said, you find him. And so they said, uh, well, we're ready to close now. We'll see what we can do tomorrow. And I said, no, I will stay here until you find him. I said, I'll sit here. You just lock me in for the night and be sure to bring me some breakfast. And they said, well, you have to leave. And I said, the only way I'm leaving is if you pick me up and carry me out of here, and then I'm going to sue you. And so they found the, do the superintendent. And then they got Dr. off, and you couldn't understand him. That's the reason I asked for the superintendent, too, because he was a foreigner, and you couldn't understand half of what he said, and he couldn't understand the clients. It was terrible. And so um, I said, you have several alternatives. These people are not hogs. They're human beings. And regardless of what you people think, they're human beings, and you have several alternatives. You can take them off of the Thorazine and put them on another medication. You can let them out in the morning and the evening. There are a lot of trees. They can stay under the trees when they won't be exposed to the sun. Or you can buy a train car load of straw hats and give them all great big straw hats. But those are your alternatives, and keeping them locked up is not an alternative. And I'm going directly from here. Unless you change it right now, I'm going to directly here to all of the media. Well, they decided they'd let them out. <laughs> they, he said, well you, only, well, you want your son out? I said, nope, I want all of them out. Unless they have a behavior problem or you have some other reason for not letting them out, I want them out. So they got, they got out. But we brought him home, and at that time, it... So, uh, now that was one mother, one mother advocate that you, you have had the opportunity to meet. Of course, I didn't meet her, but she sounds like she must have been a wonderful mom. But you're going to share a little bit about some other advocate moms, aren't you? In fact, it's, it's not, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just the fact that they were advocate moms, but who they created through their advocacy. Judy Human has become really the, 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 the most well-known person who is a person with a disability who's been an advocate and a great advocate for change. She was one of the, the, the leaders of the 504 demonstration, and we've talked about that and how that great brought about such dramatic change. It was her mother who advocated for her to be a student in the school. You know what? That little dog, could you move her into another part of the house, maybe? When I, when I leave, I will. Yeah. <laughs> I, you, can, you can leave now because it, it's really well, a distraction. No. <laughs> I've got it's to go distraction take care of the dog. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Judy Human's mother had been a Holocaust survivor. She was the only one in the family who survived the Holocaust. So she understood the necessity to speak up and be that advocate for change while change was possible. So she got Judy into the public school when they were offering her a tutor merely a couple hours a week. And it was Judy's mother that encouraged her as she went on and graduated from high school and went on to college and her advocacy work. So behind every advocate, there is a strong woman. In the case of Ed Roberts, who we'll talk about in a little while, because our guest is going to is going to share with us one of the books that she's written, which is a book for young adults about Ed Roberts. Ed Roberts was one of the great leaders of the disability rights movement. Because of Ed Roberts, there are now programs on college campuses for students with disabilities. In fact, the first one at Berkeley I graduated through, and because of Ed's advocacy, there was a reader, uh, uh, not only a reader referral system, but on campus in the undergraduate library, there was a blind student study. So I met Ed, and he taught me a great deal about symbi symbiotic action, and we became friends. He became my mentor over time. Ed Roberts' mother, Zona Roberts, who is still alive today, Ed passed away in 1995 at the young age of 56. Yeah, 50, 50, 56, he was born in 1940. Ed 
was the uh, he as of 14 years old he had to use an iron lung at night and a ventilator during the day that he would use to to breathe he would reach over and, and grab a hose and and breathe that way when he went to berkeley his mother moved the family to berkeley so he could have his iron lung and the family but ed wanted to live on the college campus but his mother was willing to be there in support living in berkeley and because of ed then in reciprocity zona went to berkeley became a family therapist and has helped many many people over the years but behind every great advocate there's a strong woman or a strong man. But in my experience, it's virtually always a woman. And the mothers, yes. Well, I'm going to share a little bit about my mom. Good. And, uh, then we're going to turn it totally over to Jeff. He's got a lot to share about his mom. So my mom was a teacher, and she married uh, kind of late in life, especially in those years. Uh, I was born in 1943, so she, she got married in 1942. And so she had taught for 10 years. She was a city girl. And she married my dad, who was, a, a, he had a farm. But when he met her, he was actually in the army. And so he was in her town station. And that's how they met. And so when they married, uh, at that time, teachers couldn't remain teachers if you were a woman, uh, if you were married. So they married in January. She finished out the school year without anybody knowing she was married. And then um, she, he took her to the farm. Now this farm uh, was a beautiful place. I loved it as a kid, but no running water, no electricity. And so it's pretty rough for a city girl, but she, uh, she did a great job. Uh, and she did return to teaching when I was still um, a preschooler and we didn't have kindergarten in those years. So right adjacent to our farm, which was a 200 acre farm, there was a little small home that was uh, lived in by two elderly uh, folks that had been slaves, Mr. and Mrs. Spires. So they were in their 80s. And Mrs. Spires became my nanny, my nanny and my sister's nanny. And uh, the, the memories I have of that were just wonderful. Uh, she baked bread every day. And they had just a small little house, a three bedroom, or uh, sorry, three room house. Um, and so we would be there for her to take care of us during the day, smell that beautiful bread, baking. And there was one room we were not ever allowed in because she made her own soap and there was lye and, and poisons in that room so we never got to go there but every night when my mom would come by and pick us up she would come out bring us out to the car and give my mom this freshly baked, baked bread or you know but can you imagine she was uh, born into a slavery family and it was what you, you figured out the year right did you do yes i th i believe that she was born in in 1855 so she was a, a slave and 10 years old when the Civil War ended. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea that you were nannied by a person who had lived in mm -hmm. slavery is just a staggering, staggering idea and, to me. And she had uh, 14 children of her own. And uh, oh, they were just, I just loved that family. I mean, they were just great. I loved going to church with them because they had these lively church uh, gatherings. And the church I was going to as a child was, uh, in fact, they spoke another language in, <laughs> in their services. And so Latin. there was not much, yes, yes. Latin. there was not much appeal for, for that, kids. <laughs> for those of you who are younger in, the, in Catholic right. churches, historically, Latin was right. the language. And then my mom, um, because it was a hard life for her, you know, she had to uh, work really hard as a farm wife, and then she worked hard as a teacher. And so she retreated into her comic books. She loved to read comic books and mystery novels. And so my memory of her was uh, we had gas fireplaces in our rooms and she would be in front of the gas fireplace with her nose totally deep in a book and we were not allowed to disturb her when she was reading. So, you know, it was just the difference of how people nurtured me. Uh, she, I never doubted that my mom loved me, 
but she wasn't one to show her emotions like that. But Whereas the nurturing was done. The nurturing done was by done Mrs. by Spires. Mrs. Spires, absolutely. Fabulous. So I am now going to let Jeff uh, continue on with the mother story of, of his mom and grandma. Thank you, Christy. Uh, it, it is so great to share with you, to hear your stories. That one especially, but Mrs. Spires. In fact, Christy, was, it was such a, a polite time that Christy never knew Mrs. Spires' first name. I want to read to you a segment from my book, Grit, about my mother. My mother was stalwart with my brother, although he was institutionalized when he was nine, and people might say, how could you do that to a child, especially when you knew where he was going to be going? There was really, there were really no other choices because schools were not open to students like my brother who were severely disabled. There were no, there was no other placement for him. And the cruelty and violence he endured at the hands of neighborhood kids he was beginning to express violence himself, and it, it was fear, I think. But um, my mother would visit every month and have to walk across a th third floor fire escape to get to the ward where he was kept, the prison room where he was kept. And she, looking down, you would see the ground three stories below because you were walking on iron slats. She was terribly afraid of heights. I remember her biting her lip and willing herself to make that 20-foot walk and knock on the door. But this is another aspect of my mother. The fires of protracted suffering and the cold water of necessity tempered mom's fierce love. She led a life of constant sorrows, but she somehow found the flexibility and grounding to incorporate humor into our everyday life. Cousins looked forward to family get-togethers and said that her zaniness reminded them of Lucille Ball. Dad is on the road two or even three weeks each month. And during those long weeks, Mom would soldier on with work and family routines as a single parent. One evening when I was 14, I was watching television in the living room when I heard Mom call from upstairs. She asked me if she could borrow my guitar. Perplexed, I took my instrument upstairs and handed it to her through the slightly open door to my parents' bedroom. She thanked me and closed the door. Having no idea why mom would want my guitar, I returned to my program. A few minutes later, mom called from upstairs and asked me to come to the staircase. As I did, from the second floor came the sound of mom cordlessly strumming my guitar singing Dominique, a popular song of the day, recorded in French. As I stood looking in disbelief at the staircase, down Mom came, high-stepping and continuing to sing in a very funny voice, in her best-remembered high school French. The staircase gave her the stage for a perfect dramatic entrance, and she had asked me to come close in order to see the moment of comic theater. I could first see her kicking legs wearing Dad's black knee-high dress socks, then her long navy blue bathrobe, my guitar, and finally, the crowning glory of her costume. The singing nun had recorded the song, and Mom had taken a white bath towel and fashioned a nun's wimple around her face and head. Her comic interlude was really hilarious, and we stood face to face, laughing uproariously at her impromptu performance. Many comedians know lives etched with tragedy. Mom's humor was, no doubt, deepened by that root. Regardless, it provided many moments of relief and uplift to our really, to our reeling family. That was great, Jeff. Really enjoyed that. And then I understand uh, when your mom was uh, very ill, right before she passed, you wrote her a poem. I did. I wrote this actually after she had passed about that week. You know, all of us who live to um, a, a ripe old age of some sort will endure the suffering, the grief of loss of our mothers and our fathers. And that is something that for many of us come as young people if our mother isn't present and we live with the grief 
of not having a mother active in our life. But for those of us who are fortunate enough to have our mothers, we will lose them. This is about that. The Roses. The first day that I saw you, in the week that brought your death, you lay attached to ten machines, and one filled you with each breath. On Sunday of the last week, through that numbing winter street, I carried twelve red roses, twelve new buds, each tight and neat. Your room was filled with systems then that crowded every space. It didn't seem those roses would have a proper special place, but the nurse's station out your door had a shelf within your view. Had you come back from that deep dream, they were placed in front of you. The roses opened soon, I think, by Tuesday's sweet profusion. I often told you they were there as I spoke through my confusion. I spoke of love and letting go, of forgiveness for the past, of family, kindness, and taking care, the gifts that ever last. I held your hand and kissed your face, your deep, deep sleeping poses. If you look just past your bed, said I, you'll see a dozen roses. The pain I knew in those few days with death anticipated, and one by one the blossoms were removed as they each faded. The last days of that last week, Mom, dear God, I prayed and cried, and one by one the roses each were taken as they died. Perhaps a few were, might still have been in their vase the night you passed, and you might have seen them on your way as you viewed this world your last. Our lives, too, with a certainty, each pass from bud to bloom, and then we fade like those roses, Mom, that sat outside your room. I never knew what happened, Mom, to Dad's ashes when he died. I thought they were disposed of, sacred ground ne'er to reside. I never knew what happened, Mom, than a healing living story. It's why I write these lines today, to tell the rose's glory. They told me that your ashes, Mom, would be mixed in the same soil. They took Dad's ashes long ago, when he passed on from this toil. Reunited in that garden, Mom, mingled sleeping dust reposes, a holy garden that is kept for memory and roses, a miracle fresh in every bloom, eternal fragrant power, and roses bloom within my heart, forever now your flower. Wow, Jeff, that's just beautiful. That's an unpublished poem, isn't it? It is, yeah. So, First um, time I've ever read it, in fact. Oh. Uh, how old was your mom when she passed? Only 71. I've outlived her by uh, over right. two and, years now. And your mom, or your dad, rather, had passed how many years before that? Oh, he he had died in, when he was uh, 58. I have to do some fast math, so that would have been 15 years right. before. Right. Right. Yeah. So, but well, Thank you for sharing that. That was a very heart, heartwarming to hear that. Thank you, dear. Now, I know uh, your mother... Or rather, your grandmother was a big nurturing part of your growing up. And I've requested Jeff sing you a song that I just love that he wrote about his grandmother. So I'm going to uh, get Jeff geared up here geared for up his here. song. Uh, he's going to need his harmonica brace. And by the way, it's a, it's a new <laughs> harmonica brace. <laughs> okay. Here you go. And then I will hand you your guitar. Okay. And you're strapped as if you draped it over the side here. Okay. Right. So the name of Jeff's song is just it's Jane, right? Yes. This, that word, Jane. And tell us a little bit about your grandma while you're getting your geared up here. Well, she also was raised uh, on a farm, but moved to the city and uh, moved from a tiny little town called Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, to Cleveland, Ohio. And when she got moved to Cleveland, she found a job that touched many people. In fact. I played this song in uh, at a community 
concert years ago and several people in the audience came up to me and said they knew my grandmother, they remember her. So any of you who are listening who went to Shaw High School, lived in East Cleveland, I know there's a network of people watching the show who have that background. Some of you might have remembered Jane. Jane worked at that counter there for 37 years. Cosmetics right beside the pharmacy. She had a smile that filled the room six mornings and five afternoons on Hayden Avenue. Jane was queen. She knew mothers and grandmothers and all the children's names. On birthdays, she would give a store balloon. A private pawn shop rings and such. She'd lend it when it meant so much. A friend went hard down on your luck. It's true. Jane rolled down the store's broad awning when the summer sun was bright. She worked the soda fountain now and then. She'd give an extra scoop to all. It made you feel just ten feet tall. So many saw her as their special friend. For she knew mothers and grandmothers and all the children's names. On birthdays, she would do a store balloon. A private pawn shop rings and such. She'd lend it when it meant so much. A friend went hard down on your luck. It's true. like an autumn rose so few friends at the funeral her neighbors didn't know her at the end but she knew mothers and grandmothers and all the children's names on birthdays she would give a store balloon A private pawn shop rings and such She'd lend it when it meant so much A friend went hard down on your luck It's true Well, thank you, Jeff. Sibling story. Okay. Yeah, the other thing I, I should have said about my grandmother is she was a principal par caregiver, not only for me, but for my brother, Mark. And she would alternate with my folks visiting the institution which uh, I, I, oh, I went uh, both with my parents and with my grandmother uh, to visit my brother. And it was, it broke her heart and my mother's heart afresh every time. You know, in family systems, especially where there is someone with a disability, the sibling is a critical part of the social life of the individual. And for many of us, we take over the role of caregiver 
after our parents have passed, I don't know of anyone who represents a more powerful example of sibling as caregiver than our next guest, Diana Pastora Carson. I met Diana, oh, a number of years ago. I don't even recall how we met. Perhaps she will. But Diana is going to tell us about her life with her brother, Joaquin, and also her role as an advocate and educator. And Diana's here. Oh, I thought I would hear something. <laughs> Diana. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Chris. Hi, Diana. How you doing, Diana? I'm great. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for that great introduction and for a great show. You had me in tears thinking about my own mom. Oh, and you know what? We have to tell everybody you had a birthday yesterday, but you're celebrating you're today. You're celebrating today, so you're <laughs> you're spending part of your great day with us, and we're very honored Happy with that. Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. Diana, in, in your life, when was it that you first realized that you had a nurturing relationship with Joaquin? Well, gosh, Jeff, I would be remiss in going into that, you know, hitting the ground running if I didn't go back and share a little bit about my own mother. Would that be okay if of I did course. that? Uh, yes, of course. So, so I actually brought out a picture. I'm holding up a picture of um, my mom is on. So it's an old fashioned black and white photo of a European family. My grandmother and my grandfather with seven of their 12 children. You know, you talked about Anna Jarvis and her mother who had 12 children. I go, that's like my mom. So my mom was the oldest. She is in the top corner um, in the back row. And she, um, you know, her family was a very good Catholic family with their, the, only seven were born at the time of this photo. But um, when my mother was nine years old, when she was in fourth grade, she actually quit school so that she could go to work to help put food on the table for her siblings. And, um, you know, she, and she worked hard up until she was, uh, until she got married in 1967. Oh, and I forgot to say my mother was born in 1942, Chris. So she was uh, just about the same time period where, when you were born. <clears throat> so my mom started her own family with my dad and um, talk about an advocate. My mom moved from Sevilla, Spain to the United States, not knowing a word of English. Oh my gosh. Um, and, you know, not having an education, you know, the traditional education, finger quotes, air quotes. Um, she didn't have internet. She um, didn't know about autism. There was nothing to know about autism. She had, um, you know, my mom and my dad both worked tirelessly to get Joaquin the best services and education possible, even mm -hmm. with the limited resources that they had back when he was first diagnosed with autism and through his schooling years. Um, so when Joaquin, my brother left home during a crisis situation at the age of 17, um, this was especially hard on my mom. You know, our family was in mourning for at least a year. Joaquin, just like Mark, ended up going to an institution because there, there was nothing else available to him at the time, nothing that we were aware of, that my parents were aware of. And so she and my dad were so committed, so dedicated to Joaquin knowing that he was loved, that they would drive, our family would drive two hours each way every weekend for 23 years. Wow. 15 of those were in an institution and eight of those were in a group home, which ended up being a little bit better, but he ended up leaving there and going back to the institution. So two stays in the institution. And my mom knew and part of it was once I became an adult and started going to conferences and started understanding that there what the institution wasn't the only it wasn't the answer for for Joaquin it didn't have to be the answer and sharing that with my parents my mom had so much intentionality once she knew that once that came to her knowledge she was not going to give up she was not going she dug her teeth into that 
and she stuck with it. And she knew she kept that vision for Joaquin, never let it go. My mother, our mother, Joaquin's and my mother went to heaven. She became an angel six years ago. And I'm happy to say that her four of her, her last four years, she was able to witness Joaquin living as my next door neighbor in his own home with 24 hour support, living a life of dignity and self-determination. Those last four years brought her joy seeing that vision realized. Oh, yeah. So I think that my, you know, the legacy that my mom left me and she would say, she said, you take care of your brother, you know, you take care of your brother. <laughs> that's, and that's kind of what we did. You know, I'm holding up a picture of my mom in her, her, um, her Spanish uh, shawl or flamenco. It's hard, hard to do this on Zoom. Um, but she's a very intense, intense looking, beautiful Spanish woman. Um, and she, and she had that expectation, just like she took care of her siblings. It was her expectation. And, and the, not that she demanded it. She wanted me to have a life, but at the same time, she modeled for us what it meant to be committed to your family, to your siblings and the ones who need the most are the ones that get the most. Mm -hmm. The ones that need the most support are the ones that need to be supported the most. And that was how my mother lived. She was always helping others. She, she took care of women. She took care of uh, unwed mothers. She, she took care of veterans. She made sure to be involved in her community. And so my mom's intentionality, her selflessness, her commitment, and some would say, um, our family would joke about her stubbornness, you know, that stubbornness. Well, that rubbed off on us. That influenced all of us siblings to make sure that we take care of Joaquin. And I was, I just feel like I was really lucky enough to have a mom that was that committed to her children. Um, and to me that there's just no other way to be other than committed to my sibling and to, to be a support in his life constantly and always be there for him. And, you know, and it's not, and it's not just that one way he taught, he's taught me a lot. You know, I know there are days when there are hard days and I'm so fortunate to have a great team of people that work with Joaquin and support our family by supporting him. But I have to say, Joaquin, who, by the way, gives me permission to speak about our family's journey. He, get, he gives me his blessing. Otherwise, I feel I wouldn't have the right to share. But um, Joaquin taught me daily lessons, and he still does, about what it means to be human, about what it means to be vulnerable, to be brave, to be forgiving, mm -hmm. you know, to be forgiving, to you know, we didn't know, we didn't know what other options there were for him. And he understands that. And he has forgiven us and loves us. Um, and what you said, Jeff, you know, he's taught me about heart intelligence and about the importance of self-determination for everybody, even people, and especially people who are non-speaking or, or, or do not communicate in traditional ways. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. Well, listen, you're a great mom too, aren't you? Yeah. You have, is it one son? I'm not sure how many children you have. Oh, me? Yes, I do. I have, I have one son that I, that I raised. And then I have a nephew and a niece who also lived with us for many years that are like my children. Yes. And um, it's funny, Jeff, my son, at one point when he was 15 years old, we were driving to visit Joaquin at the institution, like we did every weekend. And he told me, he was only 15. He said, Nanny, you can't die until I turn 16. Oh. And I said, what are you talking about? I'm fine. I'm not going to die. I thought he was worried about me. He said, no, you can't die until I have a driver's license so I can come and visit Joaquin. And I cried. I just cried. I sobbed because I was that model for him. You know, yeah. my parents yeah. did it for me. My mom did it for me. And my, it was my son got it. So I'm. But yeah, let, 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 me, let me ask you this, Diana, and not to put you on the spot, but 
are all of your other siblings, did they learn that lesson as deeply as you did? I, I believe so, you know, and to whom much is given, much is required. So I am, I'm the one who's in a position to be able to do what I've done for Joaquin. I mean, I went to school to get educated in this. I got a master's degree in special education. I went to conferences and I, and I lived in this area close in Southern California, whereas my other siblings, life took its course and they've had to go in different directions. However, they are just as committed to Joaquin as I am, just in a different way at this point in time. Yes, I understand that. Yeah. Well, so it, you, it, it's a powerful story about, about generational love, about the, the tradition of intense caregiving being passed from, from mother to daughter and mother to son. Yes. Now, I know uh, you've, you've written books for children and you've written books for teachers. Now, when are you going to write your memoir? Well, I've started that. It's taken me a long time because I've been oh, with others. But yeah, I have a book that I'm writing called A Walk with Joaquin. And um, Joaquin loves nothing more than to walk. And so I thought it was a poetic um, uh, analogy of our life together. And uh, I only have a few chapters written, but that's a good reminder. Thank you, Chris. I need to get yes. right on that, working on some other projects right now. Um, yes, and, and I have written a, a children's book called Ed Roberts, Champion of Disability Rights, which I'm holding up in front of me right now. And it's, you know, for children, old, younger adults, it's, it's beautiful. I think it applies to all ages. Um, it's fun, it's short, and the art is beautiful inside of it. And then I wrote this Beyond Awareness, Bringing Disability into Diversity Work in K-12 Schools and Communities, which is about teaching disability awareness from a perspective of dignity and respect and the social model and social justice model of disability. And I know you also teach college, don't you? I, I co-teach a disability studies class at San Diego, classes at San Diego State University. And that was really enlightening for me and, and help. It was kind of, you know, the, the intersection between being a sibling advocate and being an elementary school teacher, which is what I do by day. And then being a disability studies teacher by night, bringing all those three experiences together um, has given me so much um, insight about what the meaning of inclusion really is and what the, what the effects are, the positive effects of inclusion are in the long-term life quality of people with disabilities and what the consequences of not being inclusive are, you know, to an yeah. extreme just like with with Mark and Joaquin, you know, the extreme of not being inclusive is having people be institutionalized. And whether it's institutionalized physically like they were or institutionalized in our minds as if us versus them, we belong and they don't. We're people, but they're not. You know, that kind of, um, I think it just, helps society, it helps people with disabilities, and it helps general education, non-disabled people to have inclusive communities, it helps everybody. Absolutely. Better. Absolutely. Hear, hear. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Well, I'm going to be on you about that memoir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm inspired. I have Jeff, I have your book, Grit, right in front of me. I'm, I'm inspired. Every time I look at this and read it, I'm like, oh, I need to get mine done. Well, it took me 13 years, so take your time. I mean, <laughs> when you have me. the time, you'll apply it to it, I know. You're a woman that with, with so many irons in the fire, and I love the fact that you have such a holistic approach to your understanding, to your consciousness. You apply it in your daily life with Joaquin. You apply it in your teaching life in the classroom. You apply it in the college classroom. You apply it as an author and as a speaker and as an inclusion coach. Uh, yeah, you, you really are, are serving humanity in every way possible, Diana. And in, uh, and in your spare time? 
<laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Well, that's why I like to hang out with the likes of you. We're two peas in the pod. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, spare, you are up. What spare time? <laughs> Every now and then I get my toes painted, maybe. <laughs> All of your resources are going to be in our show notes, not all of our resources. Some of your resources are going to be in our show notes and your website, right? Yes, yes. You, yeah. And uh, so anyone who is uh, going to plug into we'repeoplefirst.com will find the show notes. And there you're going to be able to get a hold of Diana also. You'll be able to read about it as it goes by in the credits for the show. Yes. Thank you. Diana, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for agreeing to come and share your your wisdom and, and your heart consciousness, your heart intelligence with us. Thank you so much. Take care, you guys. Love you. Thank you, Diana. Bye. Bye. Instrument Corner. Today's instrument corner takes us back to Mother Earth. This is one of my favorite instruments. It's a shaman's drum, a Lakota Sioux shaman's drum, who I bought from the gentleman who made it. I was at a powwow in Davis, California in 1984, and I met this young man, and he was 27 at the time. He said, look at my arms, and they were covered, in, I could see at that time, covered in silvery scars. He said, I used to be a knife fighter. I'd go to bars and start fights and wind up cutting people up and getting cut up. And he said, an old man in our tribe said to me, I'm the last one who knows how to make drums. You must learn from me. Otherwise, when I die, no one will know how to make drums in the tribe. So he gave up his life on the streets and turned his life over to his mentor who taught him. And this was one of his drums. He said, I shot the elk. I cut the elk's hide. At one point, there was a little tuft of elf, elk hair or fur on it that has since worn off. But he said, I even cut the willow and wound the willow into the circle to wrap the drum head around. He said, this is made from a deer hide. I also shot the deer and this is oak or uh, willow wood that I cut from the tree. So he taught me about how the drum was made and I'm going to play it for you. It's called the shaman's drum because it's often played by one of the wise ones in the tribe. It also is called the heartbeat drum because it plays the heartbeat rhythm. As a single strike or or playing that drum and it uh, takes me away. Thank you for spending another hour with us today. Coming up in two weeks, we're going to change up several things in the show. First of all, we're moving We're People First, the Jeff Moyer Show, to Thursday evenings. So beginning one week from this coming Thursday, on May the 20th, we're going to have our first evening performance on Thursday evening. And we're doing that for a very important reason. We have found a wonderful ASL interpreter. So starting next show, the show is going to be accessible to those who are deaf or hard of hearing. She will lip sync as well as sign. She is a wonderful woman named Kara Beck. 
She's from Kentucky, and thanks to the magic of Zoom, we're going to be able to have her live with us, whoop, <laughs> on the 20th, and every two weeks after that on Thursday. Finally, send us your music. We're looking for contributions so that we can play you playing the theme for the show, We're People First. We have several in the queue, but none of them have stepped up with their final work. So if you want to have your family sing it, you as a couple, we are inclusive in all that we do. However it is that we open our hearts and our world to others, make it inclusive. Well, what I also want to add too, is since schools are getting back in session now, maybe some teachers could send their voices of their children singing the song. That would that'd be great. Even though it's late May, because classes are finally coming back from COVID, huh? Oh, yes, yes. They're, they're uh, probably ready to do something that's fun, like singing your songs. Oh, that's a really good idea. That's a really good, what a good way to end the year. TV, your class on YouTube TV. So next time we're going to have an incredible guest in the person of Gene Rogers, who is a guy who is, a, although he lives with quadriplegia, he also has experienced some extreme sports, which you will see on video, timed to one of my songs, Yes I Can. So until next time, all that we've said today in honor of mothers, may all of you mothers, all of you who honor your mothers, all of you who remember your mothers, all of you who are living the role of caregiving, loving, intuition, and nurturing through your heart intelligence. Thank you for giving the world peace, sweet peace. Mm -hmm.